This is the worst part. This is easily the worst part. The Green River Goat Mountain Loop is a bad idea. I'm not telling you not to do this ride. Quite the opposite, in fact. Assuming you're in decent shape, you should absolutely ride this bad idea. All of the needless torture you're about to subject yourself to notwithstanding. Get to the beginning of this ride by following Google or Apple Maps to the trailhead listed on Trail Forks. The roads between the trailhead and the highway aren't great, but they're passable with a normal passenger car or your excessive superfluous adventure van. There is a decent amount of parking at the trailhead and even enough room for you to park your glorified jalopy of an adventure van if you want to camp overnight. There's also room to pitch a tent if you're not given to shameless excess. I slept in the back of my car and it was just, it was fine. It was just fine. I've been told I rode this loop backwards. That is, of course, a matter of debate, which I will resolve next year when I do this ride again, counterclockwise. This review will, of course, be of the clockwise version of this ride. If you're riding this clockwise, the ride begins here, across the gravel road from the parking area. The Green River Trail starts out as a pretty significant drop into the Green River Canyon down powdery pumice, plum, and loose cocoa puffs. Thanks again, David Stiles, for the cocoa puffs simile. When you get to this sign, go right, do not go left. The trail to the left goes straight up the hill, eventually intersecting with Strawberry Ridge. It's a steep climb and it won't get you where you want to go. From here, the trail just sort of cruises along as its gradual elevation profile would suggest that it would do. You just sort of coast along on hard pack until the trail arrives at this intersection where there's a horse camp just up the road. The trail is easy to pick back up from here where it cruises along with more hard pack until it finally joins up with the actual eponymous Green River, which it should be mentioned is currently under threat as there are once again prospectors who would like to look for copper ore up here at the top of this canyon. It can't be overstated what a stupid idea that is as over the past 120 years, thousands of prospectors have lost their shirts in this area finding nothing but low-grade ore, but hey, I guess this time is different. Nothing would beautify this area quite like an open-pit copper mine at the top of the Green River. I'm sure they'll leave it in pristine condition. If it seems peculiar that the trees are all the same age in here and the soil is deep pumice, it's because this was part of the blast zone when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. So... All the pumice was dropped here by the blast and it killed a lot of old growth trees which were then salvage logged. In the interest of not writing a 35 minute long review, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail about the Green River Trail. It's a really neat river trail that you need to experience regardless of which way you choose to ride it. Every now and then there are little breaks where you can get a view of the drainage but it's generally a pretty easy ride going east to west. It does eventually cross the road again right here. This is the last time you'll cross a road on the rest of the loop. The trail also starts to get a lot twistier, turnier, and gnarlier after this point as the terrain starts to get a little bit more roughed up. There's even a bonus waterfall along the trail, and then the trail starts crossing more bridges and looking more and more like a bench trail as you descend further into the canyon. Eventually, the trail starts feeling a lot like the Smith Creek Trail, just sort of a jungle of alder and creek crossings until you come out onto this meadow. This trail is popular with equestrians, so make sure you're not shredding it and pay attention to your surroundings. As you get about five or six miles into the Green River Canyon, you'll start seeing more campsites, which makes sense as people backpack into these sites or bring their stock in. Anyhow, the Green River Trail is a river trail, and it does river trail things until it abruptly encounters this hemlock forest, like seemingly out of nowhere. This section of forest survived the 1980 blast. That's why it's so dramatically different than where you just were. From here on out, you're no longer on a river trail. You're on a bench trail through trees trees that gradually become larger and larger until you find yourself surrounded by old growth hemlock, dug fir, and cedar. Green River was referred to as the Avenue of the Giants before the 1980 eruption, and we're lucky to have this surviving remnant still accessible. This is a completely different biome than where you started and unique on this ride. You're not going to see anything like this for the rest of the day, so stop and enjoy it. Look at these cedars. Crap, oh, big cedar. And they're up the hillside too. I don't usually see cedars do that. 
like climb up the hillside and out of the drainage. That is a big, big tree. These woods feel downright primordial through here. Riding through these woods, I felt comically tiny, being totally dwarfed by the enormous biomass surrounding me. It's the kind of experience that really puts things into perspective. Long after we're all gone, trees like these will recolonize the Pacific Northwest and erase every trace of our existence. If you're a tree nerd, then you should ride this loop clockwise like I did, because by riding it clockwise, you'll spend the most time in this forest and you won't be exhausted from the previous 4,000 feet of climbing and then subsequently excited from descending from Vanson Peak. So you'll really be able to appreciate these woods. You'll be able to appreciate them both ways. Don't worry about it. Of course, if you do ride this counterclockwise, make sure you stop in these woods for lunch. When you get to this bridge, the jolly scamper down Green River is over and the pain starts. You've already seen so much and yet the ride has really only just begun. There's a lot ahead of you, a lot of climbing that is. The Vanson Peak Trail gains 2,500 feet over four miles. It's steep. Somehow when I was poring over maps for this area, I got it into my thick skull that the Vanson Peak Trail is all exposed. Fortunately, I was very, very wrong, and in fact, most of the trail is under the trees. The climb is downright pleasant and completely reasonable for the first mile as well. So you have that to look forward to. The forest is lovely and verdant Pacific Northwest loveliness. It really struck me while suffering up this climb that this would be a whole lot better as a descent than as a climb. Eventually, the forest starts to lose its underbrush as the hillside gets drier and you come out onto this nice teaser exposure, which is the only view you're going to get out into the valley for the next five miles or so, and that's a really tough five miles. That's probably going to take you a while to complete, so go ahead and enjoy this too. Of course, if you were riding this counterclockwise, you'd have already taken in all the best views and you can just ignore this and keep on going. All right, so keep climbing. There will be sections of this climb that require getting off and pushing the bike. That's good though, because there are a lot of places ahead that'll also require getting off and pushing the bike. So this is really just think of this as good practice for getting off and pushing the bike later. Something that you'll really get good at. You're gonna get great at getting off and pushing the bike on this ride. I don't know what else to tell you about this climb other than that it's a brutally steep in places bench full of not enough switchbacks that gains 2,500 feet mercilessly. Be sure to give thanks to all the trail gods for the gift of this hardship. You'll know you're alive. When you get to this intersection, you might as well just go ahead and torture yourself some more and head up to the top of Vance and Peak. You like views of Mount Rainier, don't you? Well, you're gonna work for it. I mean, I'll be honest, after already having winched myself and my overweight bicycle up 2,000 feet or so of switchbacks, this one mile climb up the rest of Vanson Peak was a real genuine living hell. And for all your work, here is your well-earned reward, the top of Vanson Peak. Fortunately for you, this isn't the last or only view on this ride. In fact, it's the first of many, many beautiful views on this ride. I do like how this affords a nice view to the north that's blocked by Strawberry Mountain on the other open ridges on this ride, so this is a unique view you can't get elsewhere. It's also a really cliffy view. Is cliffy a word? It is now. It's just all cliffs all around, the kind of steep scenery where you're looking straight down on the tops of 100 foot tall trees and feeling on top of the world, at, at least until a plane flies overhead. We weren't bothered by a lot of planes on this ride, by the way, because of COVID. Stick around, eat lunch, chit chat, complain about the nightmare you just witnessed, and get ready for some more torture because we're not done yet. We're not even close to being done yet. When you head back, you'll get to an obvious intersection where you want to not go back the way you came. You'll want to go left to continue this ride and enjoy some much deserved downhill that won't last very long until you get to this intersection. This isn't very complicated go up the really steep hill. That seems to always be the answer on this ride. Just go up the really steep hill. If there's a steep hill, go up it. It's always safe to assume on this ride that if there's a choice between going up the hill or down the hill, the right answer is probably going up the hill. Over the next seven miles, the trail will gain 1,100 feet while losing 800 feet. So it's a classical ridge line intense ride, ride. And all the climbs 
from here forward are very, very steep. The nice little downhill interludes on this ride are well earned, although admittedly they'd be a lot more fun if they were all at once instead of every single one of them being followed by a brutal climb that makes you gain back every inch of elevation you lost while you were having fun. One other thing that I'll point out about this trail is that, uh, or this loop, is that the trails are all still in fantastic shape, or at least they were in fantastic shape as of August 18th, 2020. A couple weeks after we rode this, a freak windstorm did tear through here, so there is no telling how much blowdown is in here now. At least it didn't all burn down. This ride drags on a bit in this section, and quite frankly, I can't imagine that the ridge up there, up here, is any worse riding it one way or the other. It's probably equal misery both ways. There are a lot of steep climbs on this ridge. I, I feel like I can keep pointing that out over and over again, but it's just belaboring the point. Rather than go over each and every punishing climb in excruciating detail, I'm, I think it's sufficient to simply point out that there are a lot of hike-a-bike steep climbs on this loop that are hard to believe. I think I finally got the sense this trail was getting the better of me when I rounded this corner, looked up at this imposing cliff in front of me, and started swearing. Yes, you do have to get up and around that knoll, but this is the last sustained and steep section of pushing you'll have to do on this ride, and it's less than a mile long. If you're a stronger rider, you'll probably be able to pedal this section. I... I did not pedal this section. Also, mercifully, the grade slackens as you pass by the Cliffs of Doom, and you'll be able to pedal again just as the views start really opening up to the north. This is welcome. This is a sign that the hardest part of your journey is almost behind you. All of this is, of course, readying you for this, the greatest reward this ride has to offer the view from the top of Goat Mountain. This is one of the few locations that I happen to have drone footage for because I've also hiked to the top of this with my drone. I did this before I realized how obnoxious drones can appear to others who are not flying drones. Fortunately, when I shot this drone footage, it was a weekday and there was no one else around. I certainly wouldn't have gone to all the trouble of carrying my entire drone and controller with me while biking in this loop. That would have been exhausting. From this vantage point, you can see all the way out to the last remnants of the blast zone from the 1980 eruption, as well as the entire Green River drainage down below you. The south side of Strawberry Mountain is also visible, but you can only just barely make out the top of the mountain that caused all the devastation that opened up this view. The tip top of Mount St. Helens is just barely visible from up here. All right, enough about this view. You'll probably hang out here for a while, but there's still a bit more additional climbing ahead, as well as a very sketchy bench trail where a fall would mean certain death. This is a pretty fun bench cut, but then I love me a nice exposed and scary bench cut, so maybe I'm a little biased. Washington Trails Association, that's the hiker group in Washington State, came up here last year and did a fantastic job restoring this bench and adding cribbing where necessary. And the effort is much appreciated because this slope is a difficult one to maintain trail on and will probably remain so for the near future. Nothing in this exposed section is really particularly steep going along the bench one way or the other. The biggest challenge to staying on the trail is not getting distracted by the magnificent views. There are some places where the pumice has the consistency of a giant pile of cat litter or cocoa puffs. Thank you, David Stiles, for the simile. But that's to be expected in an area that was devastated by a volcanic blast a mere 40 years ago. Hey, uh, baby boomers from the Northwest. Mount St. Helens blew up more than 40 years ago. Don't you feel old? Anyhow, there will be some places you'll have to dismount the bike or at least be very, very careful. Anyway, I'm yapping an awful lot about how pretty this is. I was probably delirious from all the physical exertion by this point, and I'm probably still feeling that delirium as I write this review. As you round the corner, the rest of Strawberry Ridge comes into view. You enter these trees, they're the quick downhill, and then you start climbing again. This right here is the last climb, and in reality, it, it's not actually that much, and it'll be over soon, but I, I didn't know. And I really wish I'd left the GoPro on, because this last little climb where I had to dismount the bike is where I finally, after all this pedaling, pushing, sweating, and suffering, lost my temper. I'm serious, this ride is no joke. It's the hardest 4,500 feet I've ever climbed with my bike. I got so mad here that I threw my bike down and just had a little swearing fit. It may or may not have been a full-on temper tantrum. I'm not sure, but I was tired. At this point in the ride, I was just done. 
And I think everyone who's done an epic ride or two can sympathize with the feeling of doneness I was, I was contending with here. Temper tantrums notwithstanding, this right here is where the true descent starts. It truly is all downhill from here. The trail descends 1,600 feet over two miles. It's not remarkable. It's, it's really not enough for all the torture you've endured, but at least you don't have to climb this 1,600 feet to get back to the car. If you'd ridden this counterclockwise, you'd end on a thousand foot climb back to the car after the arguably much better Vance and Peak descent, but I don't know, I guess we pick our poison, don't we? There's no easy way to ride this loop. As far as descents go, this is just fine. It's, it's a loose and steep brake burner with tight switchbacks through subalpine forest, and I'm not sure what else there is to say. The switchbacks are the fun kind of challenging, but you really have to take this descent for what it is and keep a keen eye out for hikers on your way down because folks who are here for the vistas hike up this way. It takes so long to ride this loop though that by the time you've made it to this descent, it's not very likely the hikers are still here. They've probably already gotten to the bottom and gone home. The backcountry horsemen helped out a lot doing a fair amount of excavator work on this part of the trail when Transcascadia came up here and worked with the Cowlitz Natchez chapter of Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance and other user groups also stepped up to help clear the blowdown, weed whack, and do extensive trail work to rehabilitate the Goat Creek, Tumwater, Goat Mountain, Green River, and Strawberry Mountain trails. Without the cooperation of the Forest Service and all these user groups along with the resources provided by Transcascadia, all of these trails would still be almost impassable, left to decay into the forest. So we can all show our gratitude by making sure we are current members of our local trail organizations to support the work they do to keep these trails open. Wow, that was a, uh, that was a really long review. This is a fantastic ride, albeit still a bad idea. I'd like to take this moment to thank all of my subscribers and my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support me, navigate to patreon.com slash voiceovertrails and choose a membership tier that feels right for you. If you want your name mentioned at the end of this video, you can become a Hero Dirt Level sponsor just like Heather Van Valkenburg, Jason Moore, Ty Morgan Marbit, and Todd McCarthy. Now, get out there and go ride your bike.